Okay. Uh, hi, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the next installment of the Gen3 Community Forum. Uh, we're really excited uh, today to speak a little bit more about Gen3.2. This is the um, fairly large update to the Gen3 uh, front end that we've been working on for some time. We had a meeting a, a couple months ago to share with you some updates, but today it's come a long ways and we can give you some more specifics around the new functions and capabilities and actually show some demos um, as well as um, uh, Matthew Peter Court is also here from OHSU to share their experience with uh, transitioning from the um, existing data portal on to um, Gen 3.2. So um, my name is Michael Fitzsimons. I'm the director of research programs at CETUS. Um, and those are the other um, sponsors of the Gen 3 Community Forum at the bottom there, OHSU, the Open Commons Consortium, Australian Biocommons, and the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. Um, before I pass it on to Bob for an additional um, words of introduction, um, I'll just mention that you'll all be muted by default. Um, so generally try to keep that, um, keep yourself muted. Um, you know, feel free to put uh, questions or comments in the chat as we go along. In general, uh, we intend to reserve most questions um, to the end where we should have plenty of time. So um, with that, um, next slide, please, Faye. So um, as I mentioned, I'm going to pass it off to um, Bob here in a second for an introduction, but then we're going to hear from Craig Barnes, our Front end and visualization manager at CETUS, um, followed by Matthew Petercourt, a software engineer at OHSU in the LROT lab, to share their experience. Um, and then finally, there'll be quite a bit of time for QA, I think. So, um, Bob, would you like to say any words before, um, before Craig um, gives his overview? No, I just want to uh, remind the community that um, this Gen 3.2, which includes um, the Gen 3 front end framework and the uh, Gen 3 analysis tool framework. Um, we want very much to be um, um, a sort of uh, a joint effort with the Gen 3 community. Um, and that includes not only um, an analysis tools they may want to make available in this framework, but also additions or changes or um, uh, extensions of the framework that they can work with our core team on. O over to you, Craig. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, perfect. I can't actually see the slides, but that's okay. Um, I assume the slides are being shared, correct? Yes. The new I Zoom can... interface has a tab up at the top. Maybe you can click on it. Oh yeah, thank you. I apologize. Uh, just so I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. Um, give me one second. All right. Um, Would you like to share the slides yourself, Craig? Would that make it easier? That might make it easier. Sorry to do this, but uh, just because I can't see them and I have no idea what I'm talking about, okay. not be very fun. Um, let me get it started. Uh, plus, I have to pop out to do a demo anyway, so this might work out better. Uh, share. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes, as, as Michael mentioned, um, last time when we all met, we talked about, like, you know, what our vision was the 3.2, but we didn't really have much in terms of the front end framework done. Um, we had some pieces, but but not as uh, as far as we gotten today. So um, I'm going to go over um, some of the uh, new features are our reminder people of what the what the features are and what, what sort of our goals are in doing it. And then I'll, I'll show some um, so some of the work we've done on some of the major pieces like Explorer, which is the cohort builder and discovery, which has the metadata browser. Um, and then talk about um, our, our where we are now and where we're heading towards and uh, should be interesting, I hope. Um, so to reiterate, what we're trying to do is we're trying to produce a front end that provides uh, sort of a more complete um, ecosystem um, 
and, and be able to make Gen 3, at least on the front end, and also with services, a lot more extensible. So we have, as Bob mentioned, integrated analysis tools, which is planning. Um, a large support for custom content, so um, ability, and we'll show some demos of how we do that, of how we actually are able to, um, to to add in, you know, your if you have particular data that you need visualized, you can add it in without having to require a lot of code changes from the, the core base of the core 3.2. Um, we're trying to change our uh, distribution of how we do commons. So we're going to do a code base um, or the app framework um, is basically hosted on a uh, on a GitHub repository and you're able to to clone from that. So you own your content and you own how your configurations are, which also gives you the ability to add pages and a few other things um, that are sort of a, a feature of the architecture we're using. Um, trying to make an improved user development and administration experience. So, um, you know, primarily right now focus on uh, development just so we can build a development environment that, that we can use and as well as the user so we can start deploying commons. Um, administration, it would be really nice to add and we have some ideas around how to do that, at least from the front end to make it a little easier to, to configure commons and especially configure the front end. We have an upgraded technology stack, which we'll go over and we'll talk about extensibility and customization. Um, so just to reiterate or talk about what our core technologies are. So we're basically um, React with TypeScript um, using Redux for state management, uh, pretty much standard web, web, you know, web infrastructure at this point. Um, for our application framework using Next.js 14, um, which really works well with everything above. Um, and so that also gives the ability to do custom, add custom pages and do some really complex routing and things that, uh, that is, is really nice to do. It's also relatively fast. Um, it's fast to deploy. It's fast to build, and it's uh, it, it runs really well. We've uh, we've used it to for the uh, GDC version two is this very very same technology stack, and we've had great success with that. Uh, for styling, we're using Tailwind. Um, there's a possibility of using CSS. We really like Tailwind. Um, it makes it easier to do custom configurations and a few other things, which we'll see. Um, for our components, we picked uh, Mantine, uh, which had, had sort of uh, rapidly developed over the past year and a half, um, and is a pretty complete, nice, uh, nice framework. We're at version six. We're migrating to version seven uh, over the next couple of months. Not that it really matters. It just has some nicer features, and uh, we want to make sure we're up to date. Um, we're also using something that's available recently called Mantine React Table. Um, so that's basically just a, a, a a table, it's a table component, it's tan stack if you're very interested, and it's a uh, Mantine wrappers around it, it works very well. Um, we provide our own Gen 3 components for certain for building building our own apps. And then for content beyond what what sort of applications we can do HTML and MDX, um, which is a markdown extension. And then of course, we can add in your own custom pages from Next.js, which we'll describe how to do that. Um, some of the other features were really uh, really concentrating on is styling and theming. Um, we, we have a we have some support. Data portal had great support for doing styling and theming, primarily CSS and and a few other things. We're trying to extend that and make it a little more easy um, to 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 add your own, you know, add your own style. Um, we do have some some restrictions on that, but we're trying to we're trying to make them as flexible as possible. Um, we have uh, custom data renders, so we're providing ways to customize um, through sort of plugins and eventually lazy loading for for things like tables and charts. So you have a piece of data that we that Gen three then in the core has not dealt with. Um, you are no longer stuck. You can actually um, write something to to ingest that and, and do it. And I'll show a demo of that. Um, but this global selection feature, which is not available yet, but is in the planning stages, we call it My Data Library. If you really think about it, it's a cart, but it's a cart with a bunch of other extra features. And so the idea is to make uh, sort of um, as as you're working through the system, especially when we start adding analysis tools, and you want to start adding, you know, adding things to to uh, to sort of a nice little storage area or a list of, of data cohorts. Um, studies, metadata, whatever you want, things you may want to bring over into a workspace. Um, my data library is a central way to be able to handle that. And then it will be compatible with everything and we'll have hooks in. So apps, um, analysis tools can, can use it as well. Um, as Bob mentioned, uh, we're really focusing on analysis tools. So um, we'll, we don't, we're starting the development of the, of the framework right now. We, we have a bunch we developed for GDC. We're moving that over, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the pending ones. Um, 
We also allow for what I call common specific pages. So you have a very specific page you want to show. You have a study you want to show. You have PDFs you want to show. You have, I'm not sure what you want to show. Um, you have the ability to add those pages in. Um, they're, un, they're yours. You're going to be storing your own repo. You can add navigation links to them, add iconography to them, so you can get to them. Um, and then uh, overall, we give us an opportunity to update the designs and improve the UX of, uh, of you know, the, the, the standard or the, the big uh, Gen3 um, front end that we have. And so we're trying to make that more more um, more up to date and, and a lot more responsive and uh, dealing with things like web accessibility, uh, responsive uh, design, responsive layout, so we can you know you can handle different screen sizes, things like that. So those are the major features we're we're aiming towards. Um, so when we talk about applications, we are working on the existing ones, and I say they exist because that what we have in Data Portal, we have Explore, also the cohort, which is cohort builder, Discovery, Workspaces, Data Dictionary, the GraphQL query interface, of course, then the just the standard things like profile and data submission. So another thing that's, that's, that we're currently working towards to make sure that we have um, that available so it doesn't go away. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to cut features of that. We're trying to make it as, uh, as complete as possible. And then, of course, the other ones are the, the application center of the analysis tool uh, center, um, which we're working on my data library, which I mentioned, um, some administration UIs. I think we were trying to work on an initial one for, for sort of perusing or looking at and examining uh, um, the user YAML files. Um, we have a you know LLM search or some some more advanced search. Um, we want to do things like cohort discovery and of course be able to support third party tools and applications and hopefully have a rich ecosystem of those that may be able to work across multiple commons and be plug and play compatible with Gen three. So I'll go through just some of the features. I know Matthew will be also talking about this. I'm just going to do the high level and sort of what we're trying to trying to get out of this, um, and then we'll go. We can go into more details. So. The portal style um, can be customized by saying things like its color theme, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The fonts, the icons, and so sort of your, your basic your basic um, elements that that have the ability to do things. And so we're not saying we support a full dark mode, but with the styling and theming, we can actually make some fairly radical uh, changes to to the uh, to the look. Um, fairly customizable, and uh, and and that. Um, there are some tools for, for building these configurations, especially the color theme and the icons. So they get packaged up so they're able to, to use um, with that. And um, there's documentation on those. And then the other one we're starting to work on is the idea of style override. So we make decisions on how things are laid out. However, that may not work for you. I mean, you may, may, you may have something that you really don't like or you want to change. Um, so especially since we're using Tailwind, we can we can have these styles get merged. Um, and we're certain areas like navigation where we're starting, starting to pr provide that, but we'll provide more um, where you can actually inject Mantine styles to overwrite ours. And so therefore you can configure things um, in your config file any way you really want to. So trying to be as flexible as possible, um, but also not make it so open that you're you're stuck with like, having to configure everything. And so it, it's try, we try to strive the balance between um, what our ideas are, how layout and everything's to work, and also what, what you would like to, to uh, adjust. Um, so one of the things we'll talk about is this color theme. So our color theme is based on this um, US government um, web development standard. And so it's, it's a color token idea. And so the idea you have a primary, secondary, and accent. Um, and, the design principle around that is that you would have these proportional 60, 30, 10 relationships. Um, so basically your primary color and your base color, we added base, um, is a majority of your site. And then you use the accents, um, you know, secondary color to highlight certain things and, and give it an overall good look. Um, and then additional uh, colors to do that. Um, we extend it a little bit. Um, so we have base, which lets us control like the page, the background page colors, things like borders, things. Uh, things like that. Primary is pretty much, as I said, 60% of what you're going to see. Secondary accent. We have something called accent warm, accent cool, which um, you know gives you a few abilities to do uh, to override those. We what we need to do is we'll when uh, eventually we'll have a style guide for uh, Gen 3.2, and we'll talk about what components are primary and what components use the secondary. So you'll have an idea of when you set these colors or adjust them, what this actually means, what it affects on your site. Also the idea of chart colors, which is, is in there so you can change your charts. And then we have utility colors, which lets us do things like links and alerts and a few things like that. So that gives you the ability to override those as well. 
um, we will document those um, and where they're used. And, and of course, as I said, with, with once we get full style overrides in, you can override these any way you want to. Um, and uh, and Matthew will talk a little more about this. And we have a tool to generate this palette. The one other thing it will do also at the same time is that it will, um, for every single color, it calculates the contrasting color. So it'll, it'll actually um, make sure that it's it has the appropriate contrast levels, um, so we don't have web accessibility issues. Um, you know, and it does a pretty good job. I think I found one or two cases where you need to go in and maybe tweak. You know, sort of right on the edge of one, but um, it, it does a it does a pretty good job. We'll of course be improving that as we as over time as well. Um, so navigation very configurable like data portal. Um, we can we have the ability to let you provide your own icons. Of course, we have our we have the ones we provide for Gen three, but um, and like you know you have your classic Gen three, which is you know your major navigation bars with um, with um, additional controls on top. Um, and so we, we provide that one. We also have a horizontal one, which basically sort of centers everything, moves login icon to the main bar, and then um, the the three dots will give you the basically these, the, the drop down of actions you can do. Um, and once again, we'll, we'll eventually make it so you can you can create your own if you need to. Um, we also have a vertical layout we, we've added. So basically um, left side navigation, um, we can optionally make it appear and disappear as a drawer, but we've kept it fixed here. Um, and with a lot, once again, login and, and applications are, are over here. So a couple of couple different um, options you may have for, for doing navigation. Um, the other one we're really striving towards, and this bill helps us internally for development, but also for, um, for the community, is trying to make uh, developing a commons as simple as possible. Um, Working documentation, we have an initial set that's there. It's in, it's, in, um, it's in our GitHub. If you go straight to GitHub and go to the Gen 3 front-end framework, um, you're not going to see it. Um, main is, we need a little do a little uh, housekeeping on our on our uh, repository. But right now, most of the work is being on, uh, done on develop. So um, the link here will take you to develop and you can look at the documentations there. Um, we provide uh, ENV files for configuration. I'll go through an example of that. Um, so about that. that allows um, the ability to sort of configure what Gen 3 services you're talking to. And also we will provide some fine grade connection to um, to those, so if for some reason you're deploying a Gen 3 service on like a non-standard, um, you know, endpoint, um, we can adjust that. If you have one sitting on a, on a completely other, another server somewhere, or possibly another domain, we can you can pull that in as well. Um, for development purposes, we've added this thing called credentials-based login. I'll explain what that is. Um, and the other one is is that we're using Helm charts primarily to, to local development and also just for development. And so um, we're working on making it uh, easy to run the Gen 3 development. So you can you can launch the portal. Um, you can have Helm charts running on your machine or wherever you want to, and then launch the portal and it'll talk to the Gen 3 services um, that are running on inside that, in, in that cluster. Um, but outside, because developing inside the cl cluster, um, you won't get things like hot reloading and all would take a lot longer than, than, than doing it when you just have it sort of talking outside really rapidly doing it. I'll, I'll show an example of that uh, later. And we have some support for doing uh, like rev proxy and a few other things so you can get certificates set up correctly. Um, so you don't run into cores issues, still occasionally run into a few, but I'm um, trying to minimize that as well. Um, and we have, um, in fact, apparently as of today, we've uh, merged a branch in. So um, and the front end framework is supported in Gen 3 Helm charts. Um, and our goal is to continue to refine do continuous refinement of the development support. So as you know, we're early in the phase, um, even though we've been working on it for about six months, you know, we we have certain certain development setups that we use and they work because we're all familiar with them, you know, internally. Um, but you know, as we run into things and and start running into some pain points, we'll we'll try to adjust those and make those um, work as uh, as seamlessly as possible. Um, we talked about this, we'll go into more detail, but I want to get into a little details about this. So we have these ENV files. And so, you know, you can do development production. They basically allow you to set like your, the name of your commons and, and Matthew will talk about where the config, the config files come from. And then also the idea of where your API is. So, you know, what, what is the primary service you're talking to? Um, in this case, 
I'm I'm channeling all through through a rev proxy. I'm channeling through port 3010, but it could be local host. It could be something else uh, remote. Um, one of the things as we started deploying some of these, we realized that um, and some feedback from uh, from from Matthew and the um, and people have been using it is that yeah, we would like to really be able to set some of the environment variables and the config files inside um, like the values.yaml um, for Helm charts. So um, because right now you'd have to do some changes and then and then build an image through a Docker and then and then launch it. We're trying to make this a little more seamless. So something we'll be we'll be uh, working on next couple of weeks to try to make that a little little cleaner and faster. Um, once I said you can override any Gen three endpoints, so we have a bunch of these different overrides we can do, um, and there'll be more added as we add more support for um, for Gen three services. But it does give you the ability to do some uh, some picking and choosing. Um, if you like, for us when we do development or for checking something, we can do things like I don't know, set the MDS to one commons and guppy to another, and then we can actually uh, you know have the cohort builder work on one view. And it's a little little you know odd. You probably won't run into that normally, but um, but for us it's good because we can test out new features uh, using existing commons. One of the other things we did um, to uh, to support development, um, especially with remote commons, is this idea of uh, um, mostly for us Acetus, but also you might find it interesting is this credentials based login. So the idea is that if you created a credentials file um, on a commons, then you could actually load that in and use that to to basically authenticate yourself against. Um, one of the things as you try to remotely connect to fence, it typically will not redirect back to local host. Um, so that kind of gets you into a bind if you want to like authenticate this. I wouldn't say it gets around it. This is actually the same authentication scheme. It just um, it just is a way that that you don't have to use. Um, you still use fence, but you don't go through fence login process in order to do that. Um, and then, um, and that way we can connect the the front end to remote commons. And you know, so if you have a commons or maybe a production, you have a different environment you want to test again, you could actually just use this to log in and do it. Um, it's only available in the development environment. So when you when you run in, uh, if you do a npm, you know, start dev, it'll go in development mode. Um, so it's only available there. It's not going to be it, if you're in if you're in production or any other environment other than development, it will not enable itself. Um, so even if you turn it on, it will not work. Um, and it won't show up. And then um, there are some scope res restrictions on the tokens is generated. So like if you have credentials, you can't use it to create other credentials, but that's, you know, for the most part, I think reasonable. If you want to create more credentials, you can log in using the regular login and, and, and create them all you want to. Um, so major focus we've done over the past couple of months is to work on the Explorer slash cohort builder um, and, and get that sort of ready for prime time. We'll show an example of that. Um, so we try to make it extensible to custom data renders for both table cells and charts. Um, I'm gonna show that on Discover, but same thing applies here. Um, we, uh, so Guppy, Guppy is an interesting library. Um, it's kind of split into a client server all within the same code base. And so what we've done is we've pulled the Guppy UI components and the Guppy um, sort of query generation um, out of that one and actually and just input it into gen 3.2 because it's easier to maintain uh, it's in our core library um, it allows us to do abstraction and the front end knows what it's talking talking with and we don't have to maintain another a separate library for doing um, for for doing um, guppy based U, UI um, controls um, so which is really nice and then we're all using is, is the server um, we have some pending work um, we have a redesign working and I'll show you the design. So we're eliminating the, we have tabs within tabs. So um, as you know, each index across Explorer is a different data index. So that's fine. But then when you go to get your filtering, um, a lot of times we have a second set of tabs. And so tabs within tabs, it's okay, but we're trying to refine that design. Um, and I'll show you the design. The other one we're trying to do is support for sharing selection with the same facet on other indexes. And so um, this was a request, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So if I have a particular project and I'm, I'm on one of the major indexes and so I've set up my indexes. So the project projects or the project ID or whatever is part of every single index. So the idea is as you switch between them, if you selected selections that stick on that are selected on one 
of the top level indexes will carry over and those will be available as selections on one of the other indexes. Of course, it's configurable. So if you don't like it, you don't have to use it. You can turn it off. Um, we still need to do subtables and then main tables. Um, so we're doing some refinement around that. Um, we need to work on some row details. And uh, Guppy did have some Aussie based filtering uh, for charts and some of the tables that we need to actually implement and get in. Um, but it shouldn't limit you. You will not get access to data you don't have access to. It just is the way it sort of does some some filtering of certain chart values that we need to, we need to add in. So th those are the remaining work we have to do on uh, Explorer. Um, and this is the uh, this is one of the new um, the design we're working with now. Um, so trying to find charts, we've sure find charts already, but we're trying to find them even more, make them a little the layout cleaner. Um, we have this set the shared filters for all. So this lets you if you turn this on, then if you across these indexes, if for instance, you know, let's say project ID or or, or one of those is picked. Um, and you have them on measurements or image study or data files, they'll be already selected when you when you walk in there. Um, we give you a cohort representation that will that's available um, for each of the each of the each of these uh, tabs will have its own cohort representation, um, which you also when we get the my data library will be able to use to save and then uh, come back and, and and retrieve and apply again. Um, so yeah, that's uh, this is this is what we're striving for. It's already we're already starting implementation of this. Um, and hopefully we'll get have that completed in a couple of weeks. Um, um, and then so this is my first uh, dive off of uh, into a uh, real working one. So we actually did deploy, um, I'm sure Bob has a lot more details about this, but we have this uh, imaging hub um, that we decided to use the front end framework for. And so, um, oops, and if I want to go back, so I'm going to pop out of here and I will go to the imaging hub. And so this is actually it. I'm assuming you can still see my screen. Yes. Okay, yep. good. Awesome. Um, so this is the imaging hub. We have uh, 800,000 imaging series. So, you know, if you really want to test the scalability of this, it's this is a great way to do it. Um, standard, you only have one one data tab, that's fine. So this is, this is but this is all um, all written in the Gen 3, 3.2. Um, and so we can actually do some fairly fast uh, drill downs if we want to. Well, that's really, really more than I wanted to, but, uh, um, and so you know, we have the ability, so you can actually see, you know, easily get it down uh, fat, down to, to a smaller set of cases to build a cohort. There's a representation of the cohort and I, I really want to get rid of modality. So I'll just click that away and I'm done. I want to clear them all, I'm done. Um, so, you know, we can expand and we can expand, we can sort these based on, uh, you know, the, the number of series um, or name or however we want to do it. And so we, we have the ability to, you know, some improvements on that. And then uh, the table of course, lets you do things like, uh, you can sort everything by, um, you know, body part. So you can you can get a list of, of these, and you can actually, uh, and it's all paginated, so you can get all the data you really want to. Um, some custom components. We have links to uh, remote links to DICOM viewers off this hub. Um, they go to various different um, different members of the hub, um, and this this little control here will take you to that as well. So um, this is this is the the you know the Place to and Bob, sure Bob has some some comments as well. Greg, I just want to remind the people the, the hub is not a standard term. We're in Gen three. We're using the term hub these days uh, to when there's a data mesh of two, three, or more data commons, data repositories, data platforms that expose uh, data metadata through fair APIs. A hub takes the exposed metadata and processes it and then allows you to search across multiple commons and to pull data into workspaces and things like that. And this hub, which is over uh, two, uh, now three um, imaging repositories and imaging commons um, allows you to um, uh, search that and um, uh, pull it into a workspace. This, uh, the works, when gen, uh, this is on Gen 3.2, so um, next month or so when the workspace is in Gen 3.2, you could do that. But um, that, that's what a hub is. It's a it's a way to search, discover, and analyze data across multiple systems that expose fair APIs. And um, we're, it was very nice that Craig, this is one of the first um, uh, Gen 3.2 instances. So 
that's how that's what a hub is. Thanks, Bob. Um, so, um, so that to explore, and we actually, as I said, we have we have a version of Jim. Jim, um, you want to pause to... and see if there are any questions? Oh yeah, please. Yeah, Does anyone have any questions so far? This is probably one of the best places to get questions about Chen 3.2 answer. So don't go <laughs> hold them to some other meeting. Ask them here. The, um, the data library that you mentioned, uh, where is it going to store the safe filters? There are going to be a uh, new database, I assume, uh, uh, or in a uh, microservice thread to it in the backend? No, we're, we're not thinking of doing that right away. We're thinking of just using local storage on your on your browser. So it will be, be okay. client-based. Um, but that does not mean that we will not be offering that in the future. It's just that we haven't um, we haven't really thought um, a, we haven't we haven't gotten to that to that section yet to to that sort of development yet. But our initial our initial the initial one will use local storage and then we'll we'll we can we'll hopefully have another microservice or extend maybe my, uh, the metadata service in some ways to to be able to support these. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so. Um, go ahead. Oh, I just had a question, Craig. Um, that relates to some of your, some of the points you made. Um, so nothing in here really changes how people are indexing the data right now. That's still going to happen right. exactly the same way, and it's just you're, you're enabling other sort of downstream utility for, of that. Exactly. Right? That's exactly right. So yeah, the, this this talk is literally on the front end. Uh, we change back end services of front end will adapt, but right now we we have not changed anything on 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 how data is indexed or anything like that. Um, all right. So the other major work we've done is on discovery. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with Gen3 at all, you know discovery pages for metadata browsing and searching. Um, so we have support for custom renders and table cells and the rows. Well, I'm gonna actually demo this. Um, and so the idea is that if you have a piece of data that we don't, you know, it's not a string, maybe it's an array, maybe it's an object, maybe it has something that you want to render. Um, you probably want to, you know, and, and you're like, well, I'm stuck. So what am I going to do? So we'll talk about ways to do that. Um, so we have the, for that. Um, other features we have is, um, so we define, so Gen3 has standard server, has a standard metadata and it has an aggregated meta, metadata. And, um, but we want to become, say, flexible as, as we go forward. So basically how we retrieve data is through uh, this data hook, which is somewhat com can be somewhat look somewhat complex, but it's really more of a it's a like a facade in front of a bunch of smaller hooks that do various different things, like you know actually do the query, um, do searching, um, do some processing. You filter the metadata before returning it back to the component, um, and we've defined them for how they work now in Gen three. But it gives us the ability to change that in the future. It also gives you the ability if you have other different types of metadata, but you want to hook the uh, this, the Discovery page two, you'd be able to, I uh, should be able to do that. Um, Discovery page is basic functionality is working for all the components. Um, we still have some pending work to do. Um, we have an advanced search. Advanced search has some faceted based search and a few other things. Um, we have the initial part of that done. We're just trying to finish, finish that up. Uh, study details page is mostly complete. There's a few things I want to do. Um, some of the actions like download each individual file, it needs to be implemented, but minor. Uh, selection, uh, of course, is, is important. So you'll know, be able to select these studies. And then once my data library is around, we'll be able to put those onto my data library. So that's the pending work we're, we're still working on for the discovery page. Um, I'm going to really do a demo of, of something that I've been talking about, so it'd be nice to actually show show it. Um, so the idea is we explore export extensibility for what we call data renders, and so it has data have visual representation in tables and charts. Um, charts is still charts still need a little work, but for tables and it works fine. Um, and so really the process is simple. So you have your commons. You need to you you would like to you have a piece of data you want to you want to write or an object and that's coming back from your data you want to write a value. Um, so all you have to really do is simply write a function and it takes in as a particular signature. So it takes in a data value, um, take in some optional parameters if you need to, and it returns a React element. So basically React element is a UI element representing the, the visual representation of, of that object. Um, you register the function. And so discovery has this factory, which you register cell renders. And I'll show an example of that once it's registered. Um, now what happens is, is in the configuration, uh, and I'll show an example of that. 
we have a field, uh, we just say it's, you know, manifest, and then we have defined it, and we say tell what render function it's supposed to use, and then it will actually render it. Um, so what I'll do is, yeah, so I'm going to show a quick demo of this really quick. We can do this. Um, if you can see my screen. Um, so basically, this is, um, this is running off well, it's running locally, but it's pulling data from Gen3 Data Commons.io, which only has five studies, but perfect size for doing this as well. Um, and each study has a selection of data files. And so, um, you know, which is nice, but I don't know what what's in them. Um, be nice to see, like, what the what does this mean? What, what, what's the content of this data file? And so just a, a really quick overview of that. So um, I decided that, okay, well, I want to write something to, to uh, to produce this. So basically, um, and I'm going to show some code, but hopefully it'll be, it'll be um, relatively benign. Um, I decided to take our manifest. So we, for this one, we have a manifest, which has a couple pieces of information, which is EMD5 sum of the object, its name, its size, optionally size, object ID, and the commons it came from um, in this case. But and then what I want to do is I do some processing. So I wrote a hook to process it and I created these different um, renderers. And so we'll look at the first one. This is basically saying file map, file map inline. And so I'm just creating this. I'm basically saying, give me some data, which is going to be in the manifest field. Um, if for some reason, when I process this chart, there's nothing, I'm just going to return, you know, in a, it's not available. Otherwise I'm going to render as a chart. And so how does this work? So we, in the commons, we um, we import those in. And we're going to support lazy loading in the future, so they won't necessarily won't have to be loaded in. And then we define um, sort of this factory, which is a catalog of various different support of renders we we supported. And you know, for this commons, um, and I have a demonstration commons. I'll share the link out. Um, you can use to play with, um, and it it is working. So you could you could pull it and, and start and start playing with it. Um, but if I define two, so I have a default which basically says if I don't define the cell render function, I'll saw that I'll I'll render it as a pop up, and otherwise I'll do it in line. And so basically, in my config file, um, well here is uh here's where the data files um, column is defined, and I'm like, okay, well I'm going to change that. So if I did this right, I'll be able to undo this, but I, we'll see. Okay. That did not work. Oh, actually, you know what? Sorry. Under cell function, the field is now underscores were manifest. And so render function is that, and the content type is now manifest. So what I'm doing is, is that what I've taken, what I've registered. Um, yeah, that's not actually what I want to do. File map inline. No, wait, so render function is, oh, sorry, uh, inline. Right. So I define this as inline. Uh, let me go back. So this is where you need to you need to link things up. Um, so this is inline. I do this. I now have to find it in my config file. Uh, nice thing is once you change the config file, all you have to do is reload. Um, and hope this works. And so now I have an inline chart. Need some ability to do that. Um, so I can now do that. And then if I want to. Um, that's nice, but you know, hey, I actually kind of really want to see the, my data files. And so now I don't know the number of data files. So what do I do about that? Well, I wrote this little pop-up one trying to show how complex you can actually get on this. Um, and so I'm going to quickly change this to, well, okay. Um, let me, oops, whoa, did not mean to do that. Come back. Okay. Um, so I got rid of the cell render because as you notice, when we register, we have one called default. You don't have to register default, but if you don't specify a cell rendering function, this will be the default one that'll use when it runs into type manifest. Um, so now I've changed that to, that's gonna be this new representation. And so now I have the number of files, but as I hover over them, I get a better breakdown of, of what these are. Um, so relatively straightforward, but you can you can extend this to almost anything um, that you'd like to. Um, so it gives you the ability to extend it. And the advantage is, is that we're not extending the Gen 3 core data. We're extending 
we're adding in a cell renderer that's specific to a particular piece of data. And then like the analysis tools, hopefully in the future and with through the community involvement, we can share these, we can share these cell renderers, we can, we can, we can merge them all into the Gen 3 and they're all, they'll, they'll be available. But, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it, for, for common specific data, if you want to want to look at something, then, you know, you have the ability to, to add these renders in. And same thing for the rows of the, of this particular table, um, uh, the cohort builder, same thing with charts, same thing with the tables in there. And so various abilities to add these customizations in there. Um, any questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna continue. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna finish this up. Wait, please do the slideshow. Uh, all right, um, so I showed these two. Um, the last thing is custom pages. So the application framework of Gen 3.2 is Next.js. We're using 14.1. 14.2 just came out, but uh, whatever, we'll, we'll update um, soon. Um, so really, all you need to do in your comments to add a new page um, is adding a, uh, and I don't know why it says, well, it should be a TSX file. I don't know why it says K, but eh, that's okay. We will uh, go back to that to source pages. And then we have a template. So the, this, the commons and also the Gen 3 sample commons has a sample page. And so what it basically does is um, it just says this little text thing. You can add your own content here um, and add a link to the navigation bar, et cetera. It tells you what the instructions are, but basically we take the nav page layout, which will take your navigation uh, layout and then basically provide you a page. Um, and so like if I really wanted to do, let's see, this should work, but let's just find out. Um, it's compiling it. So yeah, so this is it. So you have you have your navigation, but now you have your own custom content. Um, and if I wanted to, now I noticed I went directly to the link. There is no link up here to it, but if I wanted to, I could easily add a button or some anywhere in the navigation to, to go to that. Um, so yeah, so sample pages are are uh, are a good way to uh, to to be able to um, to add your own content. Um, and then if you really want to, if you really wanted to do something fun, you could actually go go in and look at how we built. Um, I don't know, maybe explore uh, the cohort builder and want to do something different. You could take all those components and kind of piece them together and build your own explorer page. Or if you want to have two for some reason, you can you can do that. So there's lots of different options you can actually do. Um, and you could also, also um, when we support, I mean, this you can just put plain HTML here. Uh, when we support Markdown, we'll be able to load in Markdown files and render those. So there's a lot of capabilities you, you'll have um, to add in your own, your own custom pages. Um, and then, as Bob mentioned, work in the analysis tool center, some early designs of, uh, of what we're doing there. Um, and then like the notebook viewer as well. Um, so we're, we're we working the design phase of this now, and then we'll be starting implementation, I think, next month. Um, as uh, we're transitioning over to um, Gen 3.2, of course, as you see, we have a lot working. There's still ways to do um, things like data submission. It, is lagging behind, um, but it is possible um, either through the Kubernetes or um, our Helm charts to run data portal simultaneously with Gen 3. Um, and this is no longer true. It's currently in the main branch. So um, I knew well, I had Why don't you just emphasize that, that this will take a little time to get all the components um, yes. ported to Gen 3.2. Along the way, there is the ability to run in what is called hybrid mode in which you're running the current Gen 3 components in the same commons as the new Gen 3.2 components. Correct. And that gives you a nice transition path that the team has worked out. Yes, yeah, it has, it has. And then we, there, there's a, we're the, one of the only little issues that we're, we're still working on is when you log in, if you log into one of them, you wanna make sure the login is still valid on the other. So we're, um, that, that we're working on now, but in general, works fairly well. Um, and for things like data submission, you could run, you know, Gen 3.2. And the only thing you maybe need the portal for is data submission um, to have those interfaces. Um, you'll be there. But we are we are um, progressing towards getting the piece written uh, features done. Roadmap. Um, so we're in on in May. So we're we're working on um, talked about the update. Uh, updates to Explorer and Discovery page. Those mentioned will be done this month where we're also working on workspaces. Um, 
and uh, we also uh, we probably will have a good part of data dictionary done as well. Maybe not the graph view, but we're trying to push data dictionary in. Uh, in June, we'll try we'll have an initial pass of the analysis center of my data library um, using local storage for your selections. Um, and finish up data dictionary in July. Um, we'll try to roll out some new applications. That this will have the analysis center. Um, we're going to have some options for doing home pages, um, some layout options, so you can do do things um, for incorporation of charts and and some other displays. Maybe not a full dashboard on the home page, but you know, the ability to be able to do something. Um, we'll start working on data submission, um, but that because we can we can run hybrid mode, um, that's not as critical. Um, and you know it's new code, so obviously there are going to be some issues and there'll be some flaws and things we haven't thought about. Um, we're still teasing out some of the uh, the very interesting things that are in Data Portal and moving them over or, or trying to refactor them. Um, not much testing right now. Working on a testing framework, um, so they'll, they'll be rolling out over the next few months. Um, definitely want to start to address accessibility compliance. Um, our designer uh, is who's. Uh, become really good expert at that will be helping us. Um, a lot of the learnings we took from uh, from our development of uh, GDC Portal V2 um, will be carried over from here. Documentation, we have some now, we'll definitely be improving that. Um, working on the improved deployment configurations, um, we'll have some better modals. Um, at, one, at some point, we're going to jump over to Next.js, has different ways of basically structuring your app. And so the app router is the, their new way. Um, it carried some headaches initially when the previous version came out, so I didn't we didn't bother probably moving over to that, which would make things like layouts a little simpler. Um, Server-side rendering components would be there. And then we'll try to do some uh, configuration um, with you know an admin UI, at least for some parts of it. And then config validation is one thing we really like to do. So you configure your comments, we can run a few things to ensure that it works. And I'm sure we'll find many things along the way that we need to improve, but that is kind of where we're at. Um, and then I... Um, I'm done. I know we have a QA and a at the end, but does anyone have any initial questions right now? Otherwise, I'll give it over to Matthew. Um, I have a question about when are you going to, are you using this in production? And what is your transition in using the new Gen 3.2 in production? Um, we are using in production because we're using in the imaging, uh, imaging uh, hub. Um, so that's one area where we actually are using it. Um, we, I would like to get the remaining functionality of like at least explore, discover, and you know do some more validations of of login and protected content and ensure that we're all good there. Um, there's a few visual things we can fix, but within the next month, um, you can have a. We we should be production ready. Um, testing is lagging, but we'll try to add that in so we can um, we can we can you know you can test it before launching um, with the amount of one issue is that with the amount of customization you can actually do on your own commons um, that testing might be interesting to try to do so we'll have to figure out uh, ways to support that but um, that's kind of our plan yeah i mean just we're using it in production in open access now and um, um, you said within a month we'll ha we'll have a commons up in production with it uh, uh, yeah, I th I'd say within a month we'll we'll be I hope we'll be stable enough to have like a couple of the commons running uh, that we have now uh, moved over to three point two. And you, okay, um, over to uh, back to you, Craig, and back to the questions. Yes, any more questions, Alan? Yeah, you showed that. Um... The analysis pieces are on the roadmap maybe this summer, but could you just say a little bit more about kind of the intentions there? And as a quick follow up, um, uh, um, can you say something about extensibility with sure. regard to the analysis piece? Yeah, so so um, we we took we took some learnings from GDC Portal version two, which we developed the same thing. And I don't know if you have seen it, but one of the things that has an analysis center and has various different apps. And so what, what happens is it's kind of context sensitive. So depending on what you've selected and what you've done, um, you may have an analysis tool that works on whatever your current my data library, your current data selection is, and you may want to do something with that. So the analysis tools give you the ability to take your incoming data. Um, and so the inputs is the data, um, maybe some local filtering, local analysis, and then in this case, writing some files out. Um, so the view of that is to do things that we haven't really uh, provided in, you know, in Gen3. Gen3 gives us the ability to look at all the data, but we can't think of every single app that you possibly want to do. Um, and so 
the ability to add in new applications that sort of launch on their own. You know, they have their own little card, they launch, they launch within their own um, window or sub window, and then have the ability to do some data transformation, data visualization, uh, we can think of all sorts of things to do. Um, and then, and then, um, and then move on. So your workflow becomes something like, you know, I, I discover data, I, I search for data, I discover data, I build a cohort, I use that cohort to go into, you know, this analysis tool, I refine my cohort, I produce some data files, and I use those data files in, you know, a workspace, and then I publish those results. Or, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but that's kind of the sole purpose of that. And they're sort of self-contained, so they can have their own stores, they can talk to other remote third party services, and a few other things. So they're not, they, they give the ability to sort of blend and hard, you know, blend and pull in various other things you may want to do uh, or services or, or even tools that already exist out there somewhere that you want to bring in as, as a tool. Um, you know, and they're not, they're not like a, a top level page. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not a new page. If they become super valuable, we could turn them into that. And I'm sure there are ways we can, we can make it uh, work that way. But that's the idea is that, you know, extensibility make make these make uh, and so the framework will let you plug into gen 3 services get what the current selections are get maybe the history of what users have done so they know what the inputs are and uh and 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 be able to to go in and 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 do whatever domain specific tasks that's in the it's in these apps all right um craig i have one question um, before we turn it over. Um, so, you know, you showed a lot of <clears throat> huge amount of opportunity for customization, which um, I think a lot of people will find exciting, but uh, I'm just curious about um, groups that may want to, you know, not do as much customization <laughs> but, uh, or to work um, from default and just, uh, I don't know if you can speak to, to that, I guess that will have a good um, kind of system that that works pretty well by default. Yeah, our, our 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 basic the other goal is yes, the other goal is not make it so extensible that you don't. Have, so um, what we're trying to do is, is we'll try to be feature feature compatible um, with data portal as it is now. I mean, um, so you take your config file; they're not quite in the same format. So we'll write something to help you trans translate those into the format. It's sort of a superset of what we currently have now. Um, and then, but then you can just use the, if you have a commons, just want to use everything that's off the shelf, you you can do that. You do not need to extend anything whatsoever. You can just, it'll be complete enough that it can, it can work for a huge amount of time. The extensibility is just to be able to add every once in a while, we get a feature request and add something in that, that would make it kind of, kind of nice, you know, but, but yeah, you, you'll out of the box, soon um you'll be able to use it as you could data portal um i see there's a question from plumbing and then maybe hey, we'll go to matthew after that um hey uh, uh this is great work i appreciate everything that you've been doing to try to improve the ui and the front end of the gen 3 platform been here for quite a while so all this, the work that you're doing is amazing I just wanted to just kind of see how this could be uh, backward compatible with some of the Gen 3 platforms that we do have in place. So for example, we have the uh, pandemic response comments and some of these features that were, um, that you spoke about that are fantastic of how we could come back to integration to that. Um, <laughs> And, you know, at what point do we draw a line? Yeah, I mean, for something like the pandemic response commons, I would, I, I mean, you know, has like this kind of fancy landing page, you could probably bring the entire thing over and wrap it up in, in a standard page as, as I demoed. But when it's written in TypeScript, you don't have to keep it in TypeScript, you can keep it in JavaScript. So I believe things like that um, can just come over and you, you just just pull the code over, put it in your own common, um, put it in your own, you know, repo and then and just and add that in and, and you're and you should hopefully be good to go um as i said we're trying to be feature complete com, com, complete trying to put every feature that is commonly used across commons that's in data portal um i would say a data portal i've noticed has some code in there that i'm not sure where it's used or why it's you know it, it there's some there's some history in there which is interesting i don't know if i'll pull every single feature over there because that would take a lot of time but we'll pull everything that we think is important and as i said we may miss one and if we do we'll we'll get that in there so our goal is to be able not to you know 
wanted to give the ability to to take what you have now in data portal and move it over to Gen 3.2, take advantage of a faster speed, hopefully quicker deployment, um, you know, more upgraded technology stack, and have the ability to do things later in the future if you really want to. But you know, if you don't want to, then you know, hopefully it's just a very smooth transition and uh, and you get the benefits of. 3.2 without actually having any pain in terms of like spending a lot of time migrating, you know, code code migration over with the exception of things like pandemic response. But I still even believe that that should be able to move over relatively, relatively easily. And, you know, on these one off cases, we can help figure out what's what's going on with that. Well, thank you for that. And uh, that's like, uh, it's really great to be able to have some of these uh, modules that we can we can utilize as, as well as being able to port in a new code into the environment. I think that's going to be a really great feature that it's going to allow, you know, more development around the UI um, beyond the work that you have done, which is really great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Well, and, and I want to turn this over to Matthew, so he has plenty of time. So um, thank you, everyone. If you have more questions, I think we have some time at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing. And... Are you ready to share, Matthew, or should we um, take care um, of that? I can share, I think. Um, Maybe well, not. Uh, um, uh, Faye, can you share the slides? Does this work, Matthew, for you? Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you just go to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, so uh, the first thing you should probably check out if you're looking to uh, develop and use the Gen 3 front-end framework is the docs, and they're on the develop branch. Um, what this is saying is it's getting you, helping you set up. Uh, let's say you fork from the Gen 3 front-end framework. It's just telling you like how to set up a remote uh, upstream so that you can pull from upstream and not have to... Uh, deal with stuff like that. Um, yeah, just basic sub docs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are some learnings I learned from following the docs. Uh, I didn't have a uh, didn't have years and years of experience using JavaScript. Uh, so just some things I learned might be obvious to uh, other people. Uh, but NVM Node Version Manager is a really, really, really useful tool for managing uh, Node versions, making sure things work. Sometimes when something's broken, it's just because the Node version isn't right. Uh, so installing that, very easy to install. Once it's installed, it's just a command line interface. Uh, you can switch between different node versions, download whatever version you need, and go from there. Uh, also, something important to note, uh, at least currently, uh, most of the docs are geared toward uh, Gen 3 Helm Kubernetes clusters. So if you don't have a Gen 3 instance, it's going to be hard to develop uh, and uh, run your local uh, build of the front-end framework and proxy to the other microservices if they just don't exist. Uh, so it is uh, uh, important uh, to understand that there's uh, in the docs, there's two setups. Uh, one of them is a uh, Nginx setup. And so it relies on running a, a local instance on localhost. Uh, but let's say you have in your ETC host file defined something else, like a different name. Uh, you're going to have to change those uh, default setups to match what you have. So don't assume that uh, the template uh, rev proxy that you have set up or that's given for you and the docs is going to be perfect, but it's going to work for the local host. <clears throat> um, yeah, other things, uh, there's two repositories. There's a commons front end and there's a Gen 3 front end framework. Uh, so the idea behind this is the commons front end. Let's say you don't want to uh, get into the weeds of the core and the front end app. Uh, you just want to customize some things and add your own content. Uh, maybe that's something that's more uh, what you should fork for. But if you're interested in making additions to the actual, like Craig was showing earlier, uh, the discovery page, uh, he was showing how to like make an addition to that. Or, uh, you might be more geared towards uh, forking directly from the Gen 3 front end framework uh, repository because uh, that one has the packages core and front end for you to work on directly and you're not importing them uh, as packages. Uh, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so like uh, Craig had said earlier, the uh, Gen 3 Helm uh, PR, this has actually closed, I think. Last I checked, it hadn't been, it was still open, but I think it's closed. Uh, so what this does is it supports you being able to use the uh, older front-end framework and then the 3.2 3 together. 
uh, with your Helm setup. Uh, so you can have them both running, uh, make it a little easier to transition between the two uh, frameworks. Uh, some things I had learned uh, when trying to deploy using this PR, uh, it wasn't super uh, familiar with JavaScript, so I didn't have the TypeScript uh, data structures defined initially when I tried to uh, do an NPM run build, uh, got a whole bunch of errors and realized, okay, yeah, you got to have TypeScript to get this thing to build in a production state and be able to deploy through a Docker image. So, yep, stuff like that. Um, Oh yeah, and then another thing that's important to note is uh, when you're doing an NPM run dev, which would be like what you would use to run a development instance that supports hot reloading and stuff like that using a local setup, uh, you're gonna have a development environment variables file, but it's gonna be a different file when you ship to production. And so this is something that uh, Craig had talked about earlier. Uh, it'd be very helpful if this could be defined in a, um, these variables could be defined in a Helm chart. So uh, you don't have to manually specify that, but that'll probably be, uh, won't be a problem soon. So yeah, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is going into the setup of the sample commons directory. So when you fork uh, your, uh, when you fork from Gen, Gen 3 front end framework, uh, no matter what you're using, sample commons or the straight up uh, full all, all features Gen 3 front end framework, you're gonna have a sample commons directory. And inside this directory, you have three subdirectories that are most important. And then there's just a couple of config files that I don't think I'm gonna cover because they're, yeah. Uh, so there's the public, the config and the SRC. So starting with SRC, uh, basically what you have here is a pages directory that contains uh, all the pages uh, that are supported default in front end framework. And this is where you'd put like a new page that you wanted uh, to add to the front end framework. Uh, you'd put it in the pages directory. Um, uh, a lot of the components in these are like top level components. Uh, so if you wanted to actually like dig into them, you'd have to go into the front end package and then edit them from there and then uh, rebuild and then they would be imported from here. But uh, yeah, you can make all your additions in the pages directory. Uh, in public, this is where you'd put like uh, custom content, uh, images, uh, stuff like that. Uh, you put fonts there too. Uh, and then in config, this is where all the config files live. I'll talk about this more a little later. Uh, but the beauty of this uh, front, front end framework is it can support multiple uh, common setups. So if you see there on the right hand side, the third image to the, the third image uh, from left to right, uh, there's this BRH directory and then there's this Gen 3 directory. Um, and so uh, if you go into the site config.json file, which is also in that image at the very bottom, you can specify which front end you want to use. Uh, which set of config files you want to specify. So let's say you literally had two different website setups. You can specify which one to use so that you could use, theoretically use the same image. And you, if you specify that through the Helm chart, uh, it will it could cook up a different uh, version of the uh, website depending on what you specify. So very flexible uh, framework. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, this is getting into that a little bit more. In the center of your screen, you see that site config.json file I just talked about. It's set up for uh, serving the Gen 3 config. Uh, also, there's a session.json uh, uh, config file. This config file is a little bit more... Um, uh, some of the some of the concepts aren't as obvious. Uh, in, in active time limit, this one is just literally if you leave the page hanging, how long is it going to take before you make another action and it tells you, oh, you have to log in again. And then upside, up, update session time is uh, how often does the uh, web page itself uh, check out the token, make sure it's valid. Um, so yeah, so if you left it hanging for like 20 minutes and it had just checked the token, it could be 25 minutes until it invalidates it and tells you to log back in. Uh, and then at the bottom there, theme fonts, so there'll be a slide on this later, but this is where you'd specify your fonts. Uh, it's set up in such a way where you can have different uh, fonts for different types of textual content. So for example, headings, uh, you could have a different font. Content, you could have a different font. And uh, font family was added uh, when adding a, a, a custom font, but I think that's also a customizable. And then on the right here, uh, sample commons config. Um, this is, uh, I think it's uh, one of the colors file. I can't, forget. I think it's gen three colors, yeah, dot JSON. Um, this is, so let's say you wanted like a specific two or three uh, different colors. This is like the top, uppermost top level uh, color config file. So you would put the color hex values uh, here. And then uh, 
when you run npm run build, I believe, it will build out a second color config file. And then from there, let's say you didn't exactly like everything that got generated because it will also generate like contrast colors and complementary colors and other stuff like that. Uh, you could edit that file and get set it up the way you want it to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide is just to illustrate how uh, straightforward it is to use the Gen3 uh, front-end framework and customize pages the way you want them to look. Um, so uh, the idea here is there's this uh, top content structure, and within this structure, you can define uh, any number of uh, dictionary elements uh, to suit what you want. Uh, there isn't currently a list of all the suita uh, suitable uh, things you can put in here, um, but that would be probably really helpful just to illustrate how uh, customizable the front-end framework truly is. I, th I believe when I first saw this, there weren't uh, three text dictionaries uh, defined, uh, but to match our old uh, our old uh, front end uh, windmill, uh, the way it was set up, I had added like one or two extra uh, just to um, uh, yeah keep it the way it was uh, before. And then uh, there's this bottom content, uh, same type of idea. Really, the only thing that isn't customizable here is the login button. And that's because since it's the login page, there should probably be a login button to allow the user to be able to log in the website. Um, yeah, and you can just see everything else straight across, even the custom image, uh, images slash gene SVG um, is customizable. And that's coming from the public directory, I believe. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here, uh, this is just another uh, example showing how customizable. So this is a snippet. The image on the right is a snippet from the landing page. Uh, showing how it how you, how you could customize it. So up here, the uh, dictionary elements have changed a little bit, but it's the same type of idea. Uh, you have this split area component in the middle there, or a dictionary in the middle there, and there's a left, and then there's a right uh, a dictionary element that got cut cut off or key that got cut off. But on the left side, you can customize literally whatever you want. In this instance, it's a little bit more well, not anything you want, but there, you can customize it pretty far. Uh, in this, there's a link. Uh, uh, showing how to link to another page, but you can also, uh, but you can also uh, do do other things. This is just the default setup, but it can be changed however it wants to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is going into backwards compatibility of the get old GitOps setup to the new Gen three front end framework. So Craig had said earlier, it's a superset of the old uh, GitOps. And so the idea in this slide is on the left here, you have this image describing uh, just a uh, Gen 3 uh, GitOps is publicly available on the uh, data portal uh, repository showing the top level key names and showing how the in the Gen 3 uh, config file I had shown earlier, there's very similar JSON files. So before there was one uh, config file, uh, in this case, it's called brh.json. Now it's kind of mapped into like seven or eight different JSON files, but it's much more uh, well organized, in my opinion. Not that it wasn't organized bad well before, but it's just a lot easier for a beginner who doesn't really know what they're looking at to figure out what they need to customize and uh, look around. And so, if you see on the left side, there's like navigation, uh, login, uh, footer. These, these these configs are literally backwards compatible. You can copy and paste what is in between those two keys into the file, and I hadn't had any issues with it. It seemed to work fine. The same goes with the L Explorer config. I tested that out. It seemed to work fine. In our old uh, front end, literally just copy and pasted what it had. Got it had changed Guppy config setup, or it had Guppy config didn't change. Sorry, but it had changed the front end so that it was querying what was in Guppy. Uh, and yeah, everything worked fine. Uh, yeah, ne next slide, please. Okay, so this is talking about fonts and how to apply fonts. Uh, so I was curious, like how easy, easy it is, is it to change a font in the front end framework? So I did a little bit of uh, mucking around and it wasn't too difficult. I had to go into a sample commons SRC styles globals.css uh, had to actually find the font that we needed, which was this Franklin Gothic .tf, and uh, yeah, just put it in the public fonts uh, directory. This is in the public directory shown before. And then, uh, yeah, you just add it in as a font face and uh, specify it in the theme fonts.json. Uh, probably have to do a rebuild, so an npm run build. And then, uh, 
yeah, it, it was able, it was, it was, uh, I think I'd had also downloaded a plugin just to uh, detect what font it was there, but it was also a noticeably, vis no, some noticeably visible, visible, the font had changed. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you make all those changes. Uh, this is just to show uh, what, what changed. And uh, yeah, so the not not a whole lot uh, compositionally. You still have stuff on the left and stuff on the right. But uh, if we we're, we're a little early on designing what exactly we want in the landing page, uh, but there was a couple of requirements of just like uh, colors, theme, uh, fonts, stuff like that. Uh, what we want on the navigation bar. Uh, this is just early uh, photo of uh, some success uh, customizing the front end framework to fit the purposes that we want. Uh, our, our logo, stuff like that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is getting into more, a little bit more of the weeds, just uh, describing just how straightforward it is to uh, add a new page to the uh, front end framework. So, right, what you see on here on the right is the full form of what Craig had showed earlier. Uh, this is the sample page. And for the sake of uh, just walking through a slide demo, um, yeah, so we start with this sample page on the right. Uh, the boilerplate is pretty much everything except the what's within the nav page layout element in the center there. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, you take that and uh, uh, this image on the left here uh, is just showing that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show it in the next slide, but this is showing a, it's the demo button that I'm going to wire up uh, later. But uh, next slide, please. So here uh, in this navigation.json in the config gen three config uh, directory. Uh, you have this button, uh, it's called uh, the href component on the second dictionary element in the inside the items key. Uh, it's so, so basically you have a couple of options. It's when you configure a button in the navigation bar. And so you have icon, like literally, what do you want the image to be? Uh, href, which is the important one. Uh, what page do you want to, uh, link to basically uh, when you when you call it. So since the file is called sample page.tsx, you link to sample page, click the button, it'll get, take you there. Uh, and then like the name, what do you want the button name to be and tooltip when you hover over it, what text do you want to be visible? And yeah, uh, supports full customization. You want to add multiple pages, just add another uh, dictionary entry to this list, uh, add another page in the pages directory in SRC and you're good to go. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, yeah. Uh, next page, please. Okay, so now this is going in a little bit more into the weeds. Uh, so this is uh, got the API fetch. So Craig doesn't, um, I don't think he uh, his cohort builder uses this function, but he was very, very nice enough to uh, let uh, us people who may not be as well versed in JavaScript a uh, function that is uh, very straightforward to use. Uh, so basically what this function is doing is it's uh, sending a, a request to, yeah, a post request to uh, Guppy uh with the request that uh, the request that gets the data that you're looking for I'll, I'll show the request in the next slide um but yeah it's a very uh, straightforward um uh basic uh fetch nothing so super fancy here although if you want to do fancy stuff and you do know a lot of javascript uh, that's also uh very well supported in other uh functions of the core gen 3 core library uh endpoints stuff like that um yeah it's a lot a lot a lot is there uh, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in this slide, uh, this is going in a little bit, a little bit deeper on how to use that function to fetch data. So uh, these two TypeScript data structures on the left here, these are just uh, what uh, is expected to come out of Guppy and uh, from the request and the response. So yeah, so there's a query and there's variables. So if you look on the right-hand image there at the top, you have a query and then below it, you have an, a, a variable. So this is just showing very, very uh, clearly how to do a, a Guppy query through a, a Guppy core uh, API element. If, if you go on the bottom uh, side of that right-hand image in the sample page component, you have this use effect uh, hook, very, very standard basic hook, nothing custom about it. Uh, use uh, use this Guppy API fetch fu function, plug in the query and the variables, uh, out pops out uh, some data through the items hook, and you can use that in a component, uh, in another component uh, later on the line. Uh, but yeah, it's a gra Guppy is a GraphQL uh, query server. And uh, yeah, you just give it a GraphQL query and it will give you a, a JSON response. Um, yeah. 
And so in this example, I should just briefly state uh, this uh, query is a file query. So we, we use a lot of, at OHSU, we, we do a lot with uh, fire data, uh, fast healthcare interoperable resources, I believe. And so the, the idea of this query is literally to, uh, give me all the files uh, that have a link to a subject. And a, and a subject in this case is a patient. Uh, so this is just an exercise of, can I get data out of Guppy that could be useful? Uh, this was a use case of, um, let's say you have a bunch of files in a database and you want to know how many of them have a link to a certain patient to get like a completion, uh, just a sense of the completion of what's there and what needs to be there, if you have an idea what needs to be there. Uh, so yeah, uh, ne next slide, please. And so this is, uh, now we're starting to get a little bit away from uh, the actual front end framework stuff. This is just literal uh, straight up JavaScript. Um, let's say you, you got the data out uh, of the, uh, from the core uh, component and you're passing it into a data component element. Um, it's gonna, so, so the data coming out of Guppy is a list of, uh, Dictionaries, I believe. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but it's a it's a big it's a big table, basically. Well, a big list of uh, results. And so what this is doing is it's taking the list of results and it's literally mapping it into a list of uh, JavaScript uh, components. In this case, it's a grid of paper mantine. So paper is a mantine component. Um, paper elements with a text and item dot subject uh, at the bottom of that there. So it's gonna give you a green check mark and a item dot subject, which is in this case, a subject in fire is literally just a big ID. Um, yeah, and so I uh, forgot to say synthetic data. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And next slide, please. Okay, so you put all this together and you have a very basic web page that fetches data from Guppy and uh, displays it as a uh, table of uh, paper, uh, mantine paper elements. Um, if you wanted to do some kind of other po uh, data post processing to get it in a chart, that can also be done. Uh, but yeah. And uh, also important to note, uh, the header and footer props, uh, stuff like that, that boilerplate, very uh, useful needed uh, to get it to match the look and feel of the website. Uh, so yeah, that's why Craig uh, included the sample page uh, just so that you have a good place to start if you're not sure entirely. Yeah, so uh, next slide, please. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the full uh, that's the result of that quick demo. Uh, you have that demo button uh, that links to sample page. A little confusing. I probably should have called the same thing. Uh, there's a uh, a title, a very basic title at the top, and then there's a grid of these IDs that I had described. Um, yeah, with green check marks. Uh, in a later version that was using a different database, uh, had uh, done a couple of different queries. Uh, but yeah, that's what I decided to share. Uh, in this presentation. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any slides after this, but yeah, that's the that's the basic setup. Uh, thank you. Hey, thanks, you. thanks Matthew. Um, thanks for sharing um, your guys' experience as the sort of first uh, non-CDIS group to uh, really get your hands dirty in, in the front-end framework. So it's it's a great um, example example to provide the community. Um, so we have 10 minutes, which is, um, I think, enough time for a few questions. Um, since we have um, just 10 minutes left, if anybody has questions for either um, Matthew or Craig, um, please type them or go ahead and unmute. Um, I'd like to hear from you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask one to, uh, to Matthew and the OHSU team. Um, so I, I know you've been working to move some things over. Um, I guess you're probably uh, waiting from for a new a, a few other features from us before you would move your actual uh, production portal as well onto three point two. Or what is your plan there? Yeah. So we have a list of things that uh, we need to see uh, completed before we want to put something in production. I think we've shared it, but uh, it's not very long. Um, but yeah, once those get done, uh, we're not really looking for any of the uh, other features. Uh, I don't even think we're super concerned about the data dictionary. It's just, uh, yeah, just get get some uh, some of those 
cleaned up and yeah, we're, we're raring to deploy this onto our uh, development and then eventually production uh, instances. That's great to hear. Um, any other questions, everyone? Yeah, Matthew, uh, I got a question for you and like you're doing a great job with, uh, you know, implementing the Gen 3 data platform and, you know, the UI for you know, 3.2. Um, you mentioned something about that the data dictionary is not something of a concern. Um, and um, just wanted to get your opinion on this, just talking to everybody about bringing data into the envir environment and harmonizing it in a way that it, it, it goes into the GraphQL model uh, for the exploration page and so on. So just wanted to kind of get your take on that. Yeah, so we do a lot of work with uh, our, our own data model that we defined. Um, that comment was more geared towards, we're not uh, super concerned about the actual front end uh, data dictionary, like what the user sees, but uh, the work we've done, uh, ETL, it, there's, there's been a whole lot of that. Um, we have our own repositories. Uh, we've done a lot uh, uploading data in through into Elasticsearch through uh, in, uh, getting our guppy configs right. A lot of it is pretty much an adapt adaptation of uh, Fire, like I had talked earlier. Um, yeah, that that's just uh, the front end uh, page we're not as uh, concerned about. So you guys are putting most of the stuff in S3 buckets and then having some data wrangling in a back end to allow for the data to be brought back into the environment, into the GraphQL model. Uh, so the GraphQL guppy is attached to Elasticsearch, uh, yeah. which is a separate database. So um, yeah, uh, the actual data files themselves are in the S3 buckets, but it's, it's metadata that uh, guppy is displaying. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. This is very helpful. I appreciate it. It's just not um helpful for your users to see that um view of the dictionary, I guess, uh, Matthew. That's just it's not just a... not a super high priority. I'm I'm sure we'd probably like to have it, but it's not something that's blocking us from deploying the production. Got it. Okay. Um well, if there are no questions, I'll broaden the, the ask a little um, wider to um, if, if any other community member has, um, um, you know, anything else to ask, I guess, since um, you've got a lot of the Gen 3 community here. And if you have thoughts for um, our uh, next forum in about two months. You can also send those thoughts to me offline if you like. I think I just want to say a, a big thank you for all this work. It, it's looking really awesome and exciting and we're, we're keen to get it sort of get in and have a look. Um, I guess um, we've got a Gen 3 in production, so we're not we're not going to be quick to um, and, and I guess a lot of it is is a little bit bespoke because it's it's a fairly old one. So we won't be quick to jump into this in terms of a full adoption, I don't think. Um, but I guess in terms of your recommendations, would you suggest we just, um, I guess, dive in and have a play um, at this stage or I guess wait for another couple of features or, you know, like, is this a, a good stage? You, you were saying you've, you've got one in production, so maybe it's it's now mature enough for us to kind of have a have a, um, a jump in and a play and see, you know, what actually, what level of work we would need to do um, for, for a migration across. Um, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, I think now is not a bad time to take a look. And then um, for sure, if you have the time and, and want to do it, I'd love it. And then if, you know, you see something that's glaringly missing or anything you need, um, we can, we can, uh, you know, start looking at that and, and trying to get that, you know, ready. But yeah, I, it, it, there's enough there. I think it's definitely worth taking a look at. Awesome. Thank you. We will. Um, as people start to use uh, the new front end framework, uh, how would people contribute components or um, specialized widgets or you know things like that? What's the vision for uh, you know a library of, of, of React components or whatnot? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I, I think 
how I see it is that um, I think we could we could split it into like components that I think need to go into, you know, Gen 3.2, you know, they're, they're useful enough. They, they, um, they, they have a lot of, they have a lot of, you know, there's a broad interest in having them. They, they, they fill a need that we really need. We'll put them in there in terms of things like, um, you know, scope of analysis tools and, and other components. I mean, we could definitely have a, uh, you know, like a, um, marketplace is a bad word, but sort of like a commons where we put, we put various different pieces, um, you know, maybe hang it off in three, I, somewhere where we can say, Hey, you know, like you'll see a lot of these, especially for a lot of data science or a lot of UI or dashboard based ones where, you know, you have a whole set, set of uh, plugins. And I would like to actually, uh, I'd like to support a plugin architecture and there's some newer features of Next.js that let you do things like lazy loading straight from, you know, NPM. Um, so we might be, well, you know, security issues aside, which we'd have to, of course, solve, and I'm not saying we're going to do that, but I mean, um, but, you know, there would be some support for doing uh, more sort of, uh, you know, interesting features we can take advantage of that, that have cropped up over the past couple of years that I think could also help. But that's kind of my vision now um you know and we can definitely refine that that view going forward that's just sort of my my initial thing, thought about it thanks yeah i think we'll probably have to think about it some more you know that's a good initial thoughts but yeah to put some more specifics around it um we'll you know certainly work on that okay uh, final call for questions Uh, Bob, would you like to, do you have any parting words? No, uh, just, uh, uh, I just want to call out to the team. This is a big step forward and it should allow each of the independent groups in, you know, that build Gen 3 Commons to more easily customize what they need, add components and, and, um, uh, make the front end a little prettier. So um, it's 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 an exciting time. Thank, thanks for, um, we're at time. Thanks for coming today. Thanks everyone. See you again soon. Take care. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.